It's a dark night. Hey everyone, and thanks for tuning in to this week's movie review of Sucker Punch, starring Emily Browning and Vanessa Ann Hudgens. Wait, Vanessa Hudgens? Does that even count? Zack Snyder truly lives up to his reputation as a visionary director, and is one of my favorite directors out there. He directed one of my favorite horror films, being the remake of Dawn of the Dead. He did a stunning job adapting Frank Miller's 300, which is a film that can instantly turn any woman into a man. Yeah, it's that manly of a film. He followed that up with a great adaptation of Alan Moore's Watchmen and made owls look badass in Legends of the Guardian. The man is a visual artist and is the go-to guy if you want to adapt something into a film. This leads me to the reason why my reality was destroyed and my mind and heart were just broken and ass raped after seeing this abysmal garbage that was Sucker Punch. To see a terrible movie is one thing, but to see such a terrible film coming from such a talented director is a whole different thing and it hurts so much considering my fandom for the man's work and his talent. We've all seen the hype and the trailers for the film. Once again, Snyder puts style over substance with this film, except it's hard to sit through if you have blood flowing to your head. Sucker Punch tells the story of Baby Doll, a young woman who is sent to a mental asylum of sorts after she is framed for the murder of her sister due to the events following the death of her mother and the issue over her will between her and her stepfather. Once at the asylum, she has one week until she is lobotomized in order for her not to tell on her stepfather, revealing the true events surrounding her sister's death, which just puts the question out there of why she just didn't tell in the first place since she just stands there all quietly allowing herself to be mistreated and violated. But anyway, fuck it. From there she enters into her own imagination to escape the horrors of reality while carrying out a plan to escape from the asylum. I hope you enjoyed that brief explanation of something, because that's the closest thing to a coherent story you will get from this sorry excuse of a film. Like all cinematic failures, there's always one or two good things to talk about, so we should go over the only good thing in this film, because there sure is a shit ton of bad stuff. As I mentioned before, the film's general motif is style over substance. It ignores damn near everything and puts its attention on the visual aspects of the film. The film's set design and use of CGI is impressive. It isn't anything we haven't already seen, so you won't be sitting there in amazement, but the attention to detail does make it a fine film to at least look at during certain parts of the movie. Well, with that out of the way, let's touch upon the rest of the film. Baby Doll's plan is to get a certain set of items that will lead to her escape such as a key, a knife, a map, and a match, and other things. In order to obtain these items, she distracts all the holders of each of the items with the help of her friends. She achieves this goal by dancing because she apparently is a great and seductive dancer. How do we know this? We don't since it's not explained. Oh, and uh, you should get used to things not being explained in this film. She dances once and is great by default. There's no backstory about her being in a dance institution or knowing how to dance in the past or having any experience whatsoever. She just can do it for the sake of plot convenience. When she dances, she puts all the men in a trance while the other characters gyrate in order to get close enough to grab the desired object. This asylum quickly turns into a whorehouse completely operated by men in a timeless era too, which is the film's explanation for the need to have seductive distractions. 
Oh, and uh, I'll get to the whole Timeless Era issue later. During these dance sequences, Baby Doll enters into her mind, which leads her into a video game-like state of war, where she and her friends must obtain that desired item in the most over-the-top of forms. We never see her dancing as well, since the CGI fantasy brawl substitute for the dance. During these fights, you can catch influences of different aspects of popular culture ranging from anime, mecha, samurai, Nazi zombies, orgs, dragons, Lord of the Rings, video games, uh, modern warfare, iRobot, Sailor Moon, uh, to name a few. Each uh, of these levels and fantasies are introduced by Scott Glenn doing his best impersonation of David Carradine. He appears as the wise man to give order and sage-like advice to the girls before each battle because as we all know a strong and independent woman obviously needs the help of a man in a film where they are tortured by men because that just makes so much sense. And with sage-like advice such as not writing a check that your ass can't cash, what can go wrong, right? After David Carradine version 2.0 gives his orders to the girls, they go into battle, which is a real boring sight despite what's going on. This is where the fans give me the same shtick. You just didn't get it! Trust me, I understood it. I can clearly see the themes constantly in the background. I'm aware of the objects and how it relates to escaping. They need to kill a dragon and obtain a gem from it, which harkens back to the need for a lighter. I get it. I also am a fan of all the things that obviously influence Zack Snyder. I love anime, and giant mechas, and Nazi zombies, and a steampunk world torn by war. It all sounds cool, but there are two issues with these fantasy action sequences. The first is that nothing is explained. They just appear and go to get the object. We don't know how these wars and sequences broke out into their chaotic states. To boot, we don't know anything about the characters at all, and I mean none of them. No character has any backstory, you don't know anything about them. Oh, and a brief mention of something vague doesn't count as a backstory either. I mean for fuck's sakes man, we don't even know these girls real names. That's how little we know about them. Oh, and uh, these the names that they have, I mean Baby Doll, Sweet Pea, these are fucking stripper names man. And when you don't even know anything about a character, it's hard to invest into giving a shit about them. I could honestly care less about any of these girls, because no effort was given into truly making them into real people or characters. They are paper-thin, two-dimensional cliches and sexist characters that set women back so far to the point that they should just be in the kitchen making a sandwich. As far as I'm concerned, having them die is the best option, since that would remove the negativity that they generate and bring to the table. This is a big reason why the action scenes fail. There's no emotional investment, because you don't care about the characters, and they are never in a real sense of danger. A dragon chasing you is interesting, but there's no point to it if it's not real and doesn't possess a single threat to any of the protagonists. The second big insult in this film is the fact that when you give everyone and everything, you end up giving them nothing at all. A film has to be properly paced, and no movie can literally have everything that it wants. Doing so just turns the film into a convoluted mess. We must remember that when anything in a film is brought up, it must be explained. When you throw a ton of shit left and right, you leave no room to explain stuff and give it importance. That in turn just results in a bunch of shit being there for the sake of being there. Still, I can see people liking the action sequences, because it's bright and shit explodes. Let's just put it like this, Sucker Punch generally caters to two types of people. Your first is your hyperactive 13 year old male nerd whose mind isn't able to reason with the film's stupidity. These are the kids who you'll hear say something like this. Oh my fucking god! So you'll like have like Optimus Prime shooting lasers and go like bam 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 and boom and bam 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 while Afro Samurai ninjas invade the land of gods where the Avengers will be setting fire to everything and it will be like all boom bam and blow and then and then 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 like Sailor Moon will come down like surfing on Saturn's rings while Megatron and the X Men chase after her in 3D and like bright lights will be in your face like and the Fast and Furious cars being driven by the Justice League of America race on a Mario Kart track that explodes spider webs as a giant robot fights like over vampires from Middle Earth. Yeah, those are the type of male tweens. 
The second type of person is your atypical bro shooter type of guy. <laughs> bra, sucker punch rocks, bra. It had like you know women in skimpy clothes, bro. How could like that be bad, right? <laughs> hey, you gotta be gay to not like that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Let's go grab a beer and like play Gears of War while my bitch makes us a sandwich, bra. That's pretty much it. Now that's not to say that everyone who somehow managed to enjoy this film is like, but doing a search of fan reviews for this movie you will see two things. One is that no women ever give their take, and the general populace of good reviews are from the following people I just described. It's quite humorous, but I digress. After the emotionless and lackluster fight sequences, we return back to Baby Doll as she finishes her dance. The mystified guys leave, and the girls have their stolen objects that they need. Oh, and here's another fun fact. The first item that they steal is a map. After they steal it, Blue, our slick back Jersey douche, uh, goes in his office, right? And the map is placed on his wall, right? They took the map, uh, made a photocopy, and uh, placed it back onto the board. It's held by uh, Tax. He goes in, right? He feels that his copy machine is hot. Right, so he goes, he looks around, he looks at his map, he notices that there are two holes poked into the map, obviously realizing that it has been moved, right? Now, this man is in charge of a fucking giant brothel with hundreds upon hundreds of women, right? And somehow, somehow, based on the evidence that attack was fucking moved, he somehow narrows it down to our specific protagonists, our characters, knowing that they're up to something. How the hell did he do that? I mean, Sherlock Holmes is fucking sitting there in curiosity and watching how the hell somebody managed to just deduct that much information and narrow in, like, to those women after such little information that was provided. Uh, just, what the fuck? My head hurts just thinking about it. Anyways, back to the point. Now, Zack Snyder has had the balls to say that filming Baby Doll dancing would seem misogynistic and would make Baby Doll look weak, which is complete bullshit. First of all, the fights are fantasies in her head, so they were never real and thus led to her never having possessed such attributes. She gets framed by her stepfather, treated terrible by all male cast members in the asylum, she gets tortured by men in her head, she needs the help of a wise man, and fights in her fantasies donning a Japanese schoolgirl outfit that gets shorter and shorter with each scene while running around in skimpy clothing. Yeah, that makes a female character empowering. Not that the dancing would have helped anyway, but it's insane to assume that the dancing is going to make your female characters look weak when they are all pitiful to begin with. Now, as I mentioned before, the film has its times all fucked up. People say that it takes place between the 50s or the 60s, and I could understand that well, considering that the clothing and the general look of the characters. But, I didn't know that such modern music playing from old time radios during the 60s was possible. I also didn't know that iPods and iPod headphones existed in the 60s too. History and common sense be damned. At the best, the film should be considered timeless, since it has too many merges of things from various historical points. Speaking of history, it seems that this film couldn't even get that shit right. During the dragon fantasy realm, our skimpy clad women must fight in a steampunk war torn world. At first, it looks like World War II, but then there are blimps from World War I. To boot, the Nazis donned the attires of soldiers during the First World War, but they are Nazis who came to be in the Second World War! Is anyone seeing an issue here? To alter and play with history is fine, but to ass rape it is another thing. Now we come to the performances. Rarely has an all-around cast managed to unite and blow together. Emily Browning could win an Oscar for playing a zombie because she was essentially dead throughout this entire mess of a film. I know that her general look was to be that of a porcelain doll, but no one said that she had to be as lifeless as an inanimate object. I mean, you could place her in a forest of trees and you would never know who was the human because that's how wooden her performance was in the film. At this point, Carla Guccino is a bad sign in a movie because either she is bad, like in Watchmen, or the film is. Either way, she is a cinematic omen. Her portrayal of Madame Grosky was so over the top that it entered James Bond parody levels. I was sitting there wondering when the Russian from Rocky and Bullwinkle would pop up while watching her act. Vanessa Ann Hudgens from High School Musical also stars in this film, and that's a clear indication of true talent. 
By the way, I was being sarcastic with that last part. The rest of the cast members just turn in ridiculous performances that are hard to sit through, minus a cameo from the always great John Hamm of Mad Men fame. The terrible dialogue, lack of emotion, story, plot, direction, or character development also don't help the movie, and that's not counting the slews of cliches and general stupidity. So Baby Doll gets taken to an asylum, where people are out to get her. To escape the horrors of her reality, she escapes into her head, where the setting is instead a whorehouse, where people are out to get her, which results in her having to escape that reality in her head, which takes her to war-torn fantasy worlds. You know, all of a sudden, Inception's story is starting to make a great deal of sense in comparison. Another eye-gouging blunder of this film is its use of music. Zack Snyder has proven in the past that he can come up with a pretty damn good score for a film. Watchmen and Dawn of the Dead are fine examples of this. Now granted, at times, it becomes abrasive in those films, but Sucker Punch takes that and expands upon it using music video techniques for fantasies and turning many scenes and questions into music videos themselves, using shitty cover songs for the majority of the time. One has to wonder why he just didn't go with either the best or the original versions of the picked songs. Or better yet, why didn't he just use an orchestral score? At points it just becomes too abrasive and highly annoying, plus the music is just an insult to my intelligence. Many times it points out the extremely obvious. When we meet the mayor in the film, our bleeding ears are treated to a rap song of all things enforcing the fact that he is a thug. Yes, the attire, mentioning it before and at the same time didn't help, so we didn't need the song to hold our hands. Such things should be done with subtle class, where the scene doesn't give you the information, or when the song subtly comments on the scene in question, like Christian Bale's cop chase in The Fighter. Add slow pacing into the mix, and you have the perfect shitstorm. To top things off, the movie ends on a huge cop-out. Nothing that happened was real. When she sits on the chair for the first time in the asylum, she is really being lobotomized. So the events of the film not only never happened, but we don't know what truly happened. Yes, obviously someone escaped, but we don't know how it truly happened, just what was in Baby Doll's head. This is why I said that all the action scenes didn't matter, because there was no present threat at all. All that was a fantasy in a fantasy. It wasn't real, and thus there were no threats presented by the fantasy reflections or real events. Can you say, cop out? This garbage finally ends with one of the girls getting on a bus and meeting David Carrey, I mean Scott Glenn, who is the bus driver that knows the girl. How is that even possible? He was a figment of Baby Doll's imagination. This film truly deserves this title, because if you go to see it, you'll be sucker punched. And to think that this is the man that's going to be directing the reboot of Superman? Regardless, I still have faith in Snyder, but this film leaves me cautious of future projects. Now, if you excuse me, I'm going to jump into my own fantasy land in my head where Zack Snyder didn't make this huge pile of garbage. Till then, Sucker Punch gets a 4 out of 10. No!